Okay, so thank you. If you don't hear me, I'm, I'm going to try to speak as loud as I can. If you cannot hear me in the back, please shout and I'll put on the microphone. It will sound funny, but I'll try. Okay, so <clears throat> I'll talk about two different things. One is this human robot interfaces that you've already seen. And the second part is about systems in control in robotics. Because I'm actually, I come from this world. Um, so just to give you a little bit of my, my background, uh, I did my undergrad students in Portugal in aerospace engineering. Then I did my PhD uh, in electrical engineering at Michigan. And that's where I work in the uh, Rex project. That's where I met Hal. Um, then I was visiting at the Grass Lab at the University of Pennsylvania. And now I'm currently uh, in the Delft Center for Systems and Control Group in the Delft University of Technology. So all my work, all my daily work is uh, systems and control. But today I talk about human-robot interfaces in HTML5. And why did we get to this point? The reason is because we're systems in control, we want to test uh, experimental validate control algorithms. And that's better done if you have physical platforms. Now, we have limited resources, and we cannot hire computer scientists. So we had to figure out a way to develop uh, systems that we could use and reuse very easily. And that's where this idea came from. So this is what I believe. In the future, all these uh, user interfaces, the SDKs for user interfaces will become obsolete. Everything will become obsolete. And the only SDK that we'll have available is what powers the web in the future. So by this I mean uh, KDE will disappear, uh, GNOME will disappear, the Windows graphics libraries will disappear, the Mac Aqua will disappear, and only HTML will survive. This is, this is my prediction. You may be wrong, but that's what I think is going to happen. Nightmare. Nightmare. <laughs> okay. So if that is the case, then we should make our interfaces, our interface from the machine to us using only HTML5, and we cannot use anything else. That's the, the motor. Okay, why? So HTML5 was originally designed to be very simple. You can, you can edit these HTML files and, and understand what's happening, because it's supposed to be human readable. But yet, you can do very powerful things. Second, you have a wide user of base programmers, and the majority are actually not computer scientists, so any designer can make a website, right? You have a large number of open libraries. It has the HTML has a proper, let's say, document model, but it has a document model, which a lot of systems don't have, and it's available everywhere, in your phone or in your, uh, probably your uh, washing machine at home. Uh, it will stay around for a long time, so the web is not going to go away. You're going to keep updating and implementing, but it will stay here. And the interesting part, why all these things are possible, is because of the new technologies that came out recently. You have things like WebSockets, and this is the fundamental thing. Uh, this allows you to communicate uh, bidirectional uh, with, with a website. And before we had some flash sockets, but now there's, it's built in on the protocol. You have things like Canvas and WebGL, so now you can do graphics very fast. You have web storage, you can store information on your client, on your computer, so that means you can log data. You have a file API, that means once you log the data, you can actually save it. You have media, uh, you'll be able to stream your video to the website itself. The infrastructure, was our, I mentioned to you before, you have robots, these robots have computational cores, their job is to do computations, that's it. And then you have these handheld devices that everybody has, and they communicate with each other via HTML5. So really isolate the computation from the uh, human interface. So that's the idea. Now, our current uh, uh, GUI, it was actually built, once we had the idea, it was actually built quite fast. Why? Because all these libraries already exist. For example, here you see Google Maps. We just went to the Google website, we use the API. Here you have some 3D graphics, and this is some library that we found online. We have, for example, here uh, this uh, GraphWiz, which allows you to generate uh, things like finite state machines, the graphics, uh, and it does it all for you. 
arranges the layout. We have a window manager, which is some JavaScript window manager we also found online. Uh, we have a MATLAB console so that we can talk to MATLAB. So everything, you can be integrated in a single page. It's very simple. I'm going to try to give you, uh, just to show the, the GUI working now. Let's see. Wi-Fi for a second, yeah. So once my network is available, this will come online. Okay. So now here I'm connected, and now you see that everything here is is uh, dynamical. So. If I start moving around the robot, you see that uh, it's uh, sending the telemetry data. Um, this, uh, you have here the Google Maps, you have here the, the finite state machine, so everything is here and everything is very dynamic, very simple. You don't have to program any of these things. So it's not easy to program. This is great stuff. It's not easy to program these things by yourself. If you want to program maps in your own GUI, it's not obvious. It can be quite complicated. OK, uh, let's go back to the presentation. So that was the GUI. Uh, and now I want to give you, for the search and rescue people, I'm not sure if they're all gone, but uh, this is why I think this can be useful for search and rescue people. First, websites, there are little or no learning curve to operate. Everybody knows how to use a website. OCUs can be easily replaced because they're just phones. There's no plugins or apps that you need to install in your phone. Uh, it just runs. There's encryptation built in because you have the secure web sockets. You have the secure websites. Uh, <coughs> graphical user interfaces are easy to maintain. So if, if you're a fireman and you can make a website for your mom, I don't know why, would you do it? Then you should be able to change your GUI to adapt it to your needs. You can buy robust OCUs that are off the shelf, so waterproof phones, uh, they exist. And you just buy them and all of a sudden you have a robust OCU, which if you want to buy a dedicated robust OCU, is typically very expensive. You can control multiple robots with a single OCU, or uh, you can have one robot being accessed by multiple computers by multiple uh, devices. So you can be controlling the robot and then the, your boss is overlooking you and you can uh, override the <coughs> etc. So it's all, uh, it's the web, right? You can use full accel phone accelerometers, so take advantage of the sensors of your device itself so that you can steer by rotating uh, the device, for example. So yesterday I asked the question, uh, what are the needs for uh, for interfaces for search and rescue, and these things that came out, so consumer mobile sounds good, one hand operation, unified interface, high quality color video, sound, goggles, uh, immersive video, uh, and I think all these things can be already uh, delivered using these kinds of GUIs. So that this high quality video, right now it's probably easier done with plugins, but soon they're working on the protocol that will allow you to uh, not even need anything Goggles, I'm sure that uh, eventually these things will be powered by a, a browser too. It's going to be a computer. Things that are not exactly desired or a priority, uh, so they don't want complex interfaces, and there's no real need right now for sense of touch. And this is something you cannot provide with these interfaces, of course. But in general, it sounds like things are more or less covered, so that's a, a good sign. Okay, now there's a lot of examples of quite impressive websites out there that you can try out uh, that can give you an idea of what would be actually used in these interfaces. So the first one is this Nokia Maps. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Anybody seen this? One person, okay. So uh, let's see. Uh, I have it here. So this is a fully immersive 3D uh, uh, maps that you can uh, walk around. And if you're in a situation where there's a earthquake or something, um, and uh, you want to have a perspective of 
the, the location where you are and the, the, the three-dimensionality of it, these kinds of tools can be very important for search and rescue, I believe. So if you can have this in your hand in your OCU, it probably benefits them a lot. Uh, another example, uh, this is, uh, you can see it, this is an application which is perhaps not very useful for search and rescue, maybe it is, uh, more for medical students, but it allows you to uh, browse the human body and then you can uh, see it in every direction and see all the details. So this is uh, literally running on my browser. Okay? These are the kinds of things you can do today. So it's quite impressive actually. Go back. Okay, so this is the two examples I showed you. There's lots of designers making cool stuff. <coughs> People make these cool interfaces, conceptual interfaces that then you can use in your own uh, GUIs. If you're nostalgic, you can build your OCU to look like this. Why not? There's designers who've done it. So use your imagination. Make your GUIs actually look nice and not just gray and black and white. There's lots of uh, professional uh, visualization designers that their job is to convey information in an easy way and they design libraries that they put online for you to build pictorial representations of data and these are professionals so take advantage of their libraries display information about your robot in any of these ways uh, and just take advantage of all these things so uh, I, I talked to, to a lot of people and there seems to be a lot of interest in these ideas. So last night uh, I created this uh, robot web GUI uh, repository on uh, GitHub. Uh, it's empty right now, but if, if you guys want to uh, build some momentum, let me know and we can, we can already put here uh, a connection to MATLAB and to ROS and then from there on we can build up and actually make this uh, a big thing. And hopefully in the future uh, Gazebo or player will not use their GUIs, will use HTML. Perhaps. It's possible. I mean, it's, that's a Gazebo server and a Gazebo client. Yes. Yeah. So it's already separate. Okay, perfect. So perhaps we'll run on the website. Okay, so that was my the, the first part of uh, my talk. But I have to say that I, I am not a computer scientist. Uh, you've seen my background, that's not what I do. The reason why we follow this path it's because it was simple uh, and because uh, it really works for us. We get all our GUIs implemented very fast. What, I'm, what I really do for life is uh, systems and control, uh, and in particular applied to robotics. And now what I'm going to try to convey is uh, the message that <laughs> uh, there's a lot to gain using systems and control. I'm not trying to pitch systems and control as a solution for everything. That's not my goal. I'm, what I'm actually going to try to talk about is how this, in combination with more computer and science approaches, can give you much better results. That's, that's sort of the idea. So uh, if you look at industrial robotics, uh, starting in the 80s, when you see something like this, you have repetitive tasks. You have to have do very high precision tasks, all sorts of things that are very nicely done in the context of systems and control. So you can see that the development is mostly done here. There's a little bit of this uh, computer science disciplines, and this means a number of things. Uh, could be planning, could be uh, uh, learning, perception, etc. So, so in this industrial robotics, it shifted a little bit towards the system and control, mostly because of the performance that you need. And because if your environments are very engineered, you, you, you can do OK without much of this side. But now, when I look at the current state of autonomous robots, uh, I have a feeling, and maybe I'm wrong, but I have a feeling that the weight has shifted a lot to this side. So a lot of you are here sitting with your laptops and you're programming in ROS and you're trying out all these libraries and these algorithms, but I, I haven't seen anybody with a piece of paper and a pencil in writing equations. I haven't seen that. So I get the impression that people live more here. And the systems and control is actually one of the steps to get your machine running. You build the mechanical design, you plug in the motors, etc. Then you do the inverse kinematics, uh, which Ross, I guess, does for you. Uh, 
and, uh, and then once that's all done, and now I have a reference signal that I can supply to my robot, then my real work starts. So that's more or less the impression I get. Well, then I, I, I wonder, is there a better balance? Uh, because systems in control, it's a lot about controlling systems that are actually physical, that are interacting with the environment. And since we have robots, these are interacting with the environment, they exchange energy, maybe there's something that systems in control can help. Okay, uh, think about the problem of motion. Motion is what distinguishes a robot from a cell phone, right? Or just a laptop. <coughs> Robots need to move around. Um, there are some parts of, uh, of robotics that need uh, still to go over some thresholds. For example, speed. I see a lot of robots running. I don't consider them to be very fast. They, they rotate very fast, they climb over these obstacles very fast, but really it's more, mostly the body that is doing uh, uh, all the work. And it's not very controlled motion, it goes bumps around, etc. Now, in my ideal dream, a real search and rescue robot would be something like a squirrel or a monkey. And if you've seen squirrels running around, they're quite impressive. Uh, my dog always tried to catch squirrels, he could never catch a single one because he would jump on the trees, jump under something, and do all these maneuvers so fast that uh, it was impossible. So, if you want to do legged robots that do precise motions that are fast, then the dynamics play a big role and then you need system to control. Another uh, element, interaction. If you want to interact with objects, you're exchanging energy with the environment. And if you're exchanging energy, then it's, you need to have notions of uh, physical quantities. And that's where system to control can help a lot. Okay, so these are all opportunities for control. And uh, I will present an example. And this is the example is based on uh, something called abstractions. So these abstractions are perhaps different from the abstractions of computer science, where you abstract behaviors into symbolic relationships. What I mean by abstractions here is you have dynamical systems, uh, and you want to abstract them to simpler systems that are more manageable, but that preserve certain properties. Uh, and these properties could be metric relationships or it could be topology of your problem. So although these are very hard to solve uh, in control, in the control world, because these are non-linear, typically very complex systems, maybe you can find abstractions of your, your systems so that you live in a different world, a discrete world perhaps, and then your control synthesis is much easier to be done but you don't lose the properties, so you can always use those controls directly in your physical system and it will work. So these abstractions are actually uh, sometimes not obvious to, to compute because they need to preserve certain properties. So, concrete example. Legged locomotion. Everybody's seen these pictures of classifications of the gates of horses. So your horse can pace, can trot, can jog, etc. And, and we do all sorts of similar gates. Uh, when I arrived, I built this robot uh, and another robot, and then we decided let's make it walk. I wanted to do all these different gates. Uh, sh how should we do this? We program them by hand. That's a lot of work. But I want to achieve this level of abstraction where I can just say pace and the robot will pace. How is this done? Uh, you find an abstraction uh, where Walking is nothing but a, a cyclic process, so you repeat this thing again and again and again. So you can assign a circle to each leg, and that circle means a phase. And every time I walk, my leg is going through this phase. Okay? If you have two legs, you have two circles, and then if you look at the configuration space, you take the cross product, you get the torus. So when you want to design a, a gate, a way of walking, what you have to do is you have to make a line here become a, a limit cycle. You can do this in many ways. You can do uh, central pattern generators, which uh, exist in biology that a lot of roboticists like to use. Or you can do things like the so-called Euler clock, where you parameterize these trajectories directly. So <coughs> this gives you a mechanism to design gates that will synchronize legs in a certain way. 
But I thought this is still too hard. Why? Because you have continuous systems. These are typically differential equations. And you can synthesize or design a gate for it. But if you want to switch or transition gates, then it's not obvious that if you have a curve here and another curve there, when you switch to one from the other, what's going to happen to your legs? Are you going to fall down, etc.? So I thought, OK, we have to abstract this even more. And how do you abstract even more? If you think about it, when you're walking, your leg is either in a swing or stance. It's either in the air or in the ground. So you can think about an abstraction as being, I have other types of cycles, but now they're discrete event cycles. They're much simpler than these, but they preserve something. They preserve the topology. So now, these are petronets. If you don't know what the petronet is, it's a fancier version of an automaton. Uh, but think about it as an automaton. There's a state and another state. And I'm switching back from states to states. So once you achieve this kind of abstraction, then synchronization is a matter of synchronizing these kinds of uh, petronets. If you have automatons, when you take cross products or parallel compositions, things get bigger and bigger. But in the petronet world, when you take cross products, they just sit next to each other. They're concurrent. So you can put as many as you like close to each other. OK, we've reached here. Now, how do we synthesize controllers? It turns out that if you assign time structures to these elements, by, by that I mean you have to stay in a certain state for a certain amount of time, and then you're allowed to transition. And if you transition as soon as you can, then these are formally equivalent to max plus linear systems. And that's a type of systems that are written on a different algebra. And I'll show you. Now we're thinking in this discrete event world, OK? So suppose ti is the touchdown time for leg i at the event iteration k. So I'm walking around, and the moment I touch down, that's this time, 45 seconds. That's what is written on that variable. li is the lift of time, it's equivalent, OK? So these are my state variables. And then you have other quantities, like uh, flight time, ground time, double sense time. This is the amount of seconds time units that you need to be in any of these phases. Now you start writing your equations. The touchdown time of leg one at instant k is equal to the lift off time plus the time that it spent in flight. It makes sense, right? I lift off, I spend some amount of time in flight, and then I touch down. That's what this equation says. This one equation says the time that I lift off is equal to the touchdown of the previous cycle plus the stance time, the time that the, legs, the foot stays on the ground. These two equations, so very simple equations. You have a second leg, you do the same. And now if you want to synchronize them, you add this maximum operator. I'm only allowing my leg to lift off of the ground if the other one has already touched it. That's the idea. It's the maximum of the touchdown time of myself plus the sense time. So I need to fulfill my cycle. And I have to wait for the other leg to touch down. OK, simple equations, correct? And you do this in, as soon as you can. So you generalize, you have equations like this. Now, all these equations, what they have in common is they're all nonlinear in your traditional algebra. But if you consider a new algebra where you use only maximum and plus operations, then perhaps this is easier to manipulate. So this is your normal algebra. You have uh, the real numbers. You have addition, multiplication, and the element absorbing element. The mathematicians already worked this out a long time ago. They figured out that there's many algebras you can build, so-called tropical algebras. And one particular one is called the max plus algebra, where your operations, your addition operation is now a max, your multiplication is a plus, and you have new types of identity and absorbing elements. It's just a new algebra. Forget about what you've done before. In this new algebra, we have a notation. This is plus, which is the maximum, and this is times, which is addition. So in my new algebra, how much is 5 plus 6? Six. 6. 6. Very good. How much is 4 times 2? 6. OK. It's just a new algebra, OK? New notation. What's nice about this algebra is that this algebra forms something called a semi-ring. It's not a, a ring like the traditional algebra, but it's a semi-ring. It has a lot of properties. And the mathematicians figured this all out. So you can compute eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and they all have a meaning in terms of uh, legged locomotion, actually. 
So this is, let's say, uh, a trotting gait or a pacing gait. These are the legs. These solid bars means that your leg is in stance. This is when the leg is in swing. I can come up with these uh, uh, constraints that I represent by these arrows, which means that this leg is only allowed to lift off after this one has touched down and that one has touched down, etc. I can build up all these constraints. Now, I write this as a bunch of equations. These are all nonlinear. But I already know that I have a special algebra. And in my special algebra, these look like this. I can compress this whole thing into this system, where this vector is the state vector. And this whole matrix represents your gait, <coughs> represents the way you walk, represents the synchronization. So now I went from continuous time nonlinear dynamics to a max plus linear system where my matrix represents my behavior. And this is an abstraction. OK, now, do we need to synthesize things in, like this? It's a lot of work. It seems like a lot of work. We don't have to. It turns out that you can make your life easier. So give me an ordered uh, set of sets. Give me your favorite flight time or uh, swing time and stance time, and we can synthesize the motion, the controller, automatically. So these numbers mean leg one and leg four will recirculate together, and after that, leg two and leg three will do the same. So this is just a notation. From here, you can automatically synthesize models like this. I'm not going to explain what this is, but you see that some of these parameters go in here. Uh, and these numbers will go into these matrices P and Q. This capital E is the identity matrix in the max plus world, and this is the zero matrix of the max plus world. So you get these new types of models, and from here you synthesize the A matrix, and then you plug it in, you simulate it, and you immediately get your desired behavior. And here I'm just showing what's happening in time. Okay, what else can you do? You can automatically synthesize gates just by specifying some few sets of numbers. You plug it in and the robot just does it. You can also have automatic gate transitions. So plug in the numbers, switch them around. Because you have all these constraints that need to be enforced, you can safely switch gates from a tripod to a quadruped and you don't even need to worry about it. So you can, if, if you're a, a fireman, no worries about switching gates, you just switch in every way you like, you're sure nothing catastrophic will ever happen. What else can you gain? You gain things like this, constant acceleration on a legged robot. Because now I have full control of my stance time, now I can really have a real accelerator in a legged robot that will switch gates automatically. Sometimes you walk slow, you have a very stable gait. Here in this gait, there's five legs on the ground for this robot. And then it switches automatically to four legs on the ground simultaneously. And then it switches automatically to a tripod. And if you look at the, the uh, linear velocity, it's increasing more or less like a straight line. But uh, it's, that's the trend. Right? You, know, you can also look at the PTR rule. So the slow gates. Uh, you're very stable because you have lots of legs on the ground. As you go faster and faster, you start oscillating more and more. Here on this intermediate gate, it actually oscillates more than the tripod, but it's because it's, uh, uh, it's not symmetrical. You get all these nice properties. And if you're designing climbing robots, then gates become very, very important. It's very important to maintain your uh, foot attachments. If you release too many legs or if you make a mistake, you will fall down. That's a catastrophic failure. And this robot, if you miss a step, is okay. It just hits the ground and keeps going. Okay, but now <coughs> we have all these abstractions. I'll just show you a small video. Oh, one, one thing that I forgot to mention is because we, we went to a new abstracted world and we have these algebras behind us, we can actually uh, compute things and prove things. And one of the things that we proved is that you can switch gates from any gate to an, another any gate. And you, at least you can do it in two steps, and that's what's represented here. So we prove mathematically that you switch from one gate to another, and you can do it in at least two steps. You can do it faster, perhaps, but two steps guarantees. And that comes from the properties of the max plus algebra. OK, now the video. Here you see the, uh, the gate. 
the discrete events coming up, and you will see some black line and a solid line. The solid line is the <coughs> reference trajectory that is sent to the legs, uh, and the, so the dashed line is the reference trajectory, and the solid line is the actual, actual uh, motion of the leg. Now, what happens when I interact with the leg? I perturb this discrete event system, so things, the leg doesn't reach the ground in time, that means that something has to happen, right? Because you need to fulfill this uh, constraints. And this is done automatically by the, uh, by the algorithm. So here, you see the motion, it will recirculate, 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 etc. And it's generating the motions in the future. If I perturb it, it's postponing the events of the future. So the robot will not fall down. So now you can switch gates very naturally. Now you switch into a faster gate. And then you can perturb it. It will fulfill the constraints. It will not fall down. You can perturb it as much as you like. And all of a sudden, you have this uh, gated generation synthesis system that is very easy to implement because these are all a few lines of code. It's more or less reliable, right? Because you can interact with it and there's feedback on the discrete event side. And you can switch gates, you can prove things, so it's a nice uh, way to get your uh, job done. So application to search and rescue. You have autonomous gate transitioning, uh, and this allows your robots, to, legged robots, to be easier to drive. Uh, so it doesn't matter if you have legs anymore. Uh, eliminates the burden on the robot operator. You need to pick gates or anything like that. It potentially enables full autonomy. Uh, if you design an autonomous controller for a leg, for a wheeled robot, just use it here. It should be fine. And the driving is compatible with the wheeled robots. So these are the kinds of things. <laughs> that I tried to match with search and rescue. So just to finalize then, going back to this picture, sometimes we need to take a step back uh, and, and look at the big picture. And it's very easy to get distracted. I get distracted with those websites all the time and it's fun. Uh, but sometimes if you take a step back and you look at the systems and complicated problems that might seem very complex, so like locomotion, how you, how you synthesize all these things, Maybe they're not that complex. And if you find the right abstractions, you can solve problems and you can actually prove things, if you like. So all of you are doing more or less living on this world. Perhaps not all. Don't, don't switch world, that's not what I'm saying. Bridge the world. So accept these things and let us all work together. And actually, that's, that's the research that I do, is trying to make this bridge work. Okay, that, that was my last slide. Thank you. Questions? Yeah, as a computer scientist, uh, I can just uh, relate to the first part of your talk, the HTML5. So. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if this is really a good idea what you propose or the direction you will aim in yet. Uh, first of all, it's a good idea to have a common framework for computer scientists, for robotics people to do user interfaces to prototype them. Um, I think it's a bad idea to put the burden of creating user interfaces to rest to personal. I think it's not a good idea to let them design their interfaces. There are a lot of educated people that uh, are educated in human computer interaction, they know how to build interfaces to be more efficient. So I think it's a good idea to hand over the HTML to them. The first thing. Second thing. HTML5 is a, well, a nice thing if you want to prototype quickly, but it's very bad in terms of uh, performance. So we just had an interesting talk to Michael Franz from Irvine, who visited our university about two months ago. It's the guy that does the Mozilla JIT for the JavaScript <coughs> uh, um, compilation. And he told us about performance, performance issues and uh, gaps they try to close, but they still have. Resource consumption in the whole web browser, web framework has. I'm not sure if uh, an HTML5 user interface can be more efficient or be better than a native one built for a specific purpose. Look at general industry, special purpose tools, outperform general purpose tools. And there's a reason why. That, that is completely true, and I agree. Uh, I also say that we humans, we perceive things at 25 words. If we cannot get a website to be interactive with 25 words, then Either our website is not good or our computer is not good. 
or our code is just a mess. So, I mean, 25 hertz is not that high of a, of a rate. Of course, there's a latency involved. But if you're using these sockets uh, mechanisms, uh, the latency may go down a little bit. And uh, I mean, it, because I'm not a computer scientist, uh, it's easier for me, and I think it would be easier for a wide uh, uh, range of population, because we don't want robotics to be restricted to just a group of people. We want to bring robotics outside, put them in education. Robotics is the next revolution after the information revolution, right? So everybody should be able to use robots. And I, I, my personal opinion is that although I, I have Unix and I know how to use it, it's too complex. Designing a GUI in whatever system it is is still too complex. Um, but you're right, I mean, the, the performance is not there yet. But you will get better because there's Google Docs and there's the Photoshop thing online and uh, these big industries will push the browser, it will push the performance of the browser because they want to bring their products online. I think that's going to happen. No professional graphics artists, uh, not some of them, we work with Photoshop online just because of performance issues and the different parts. So if you're just going to Firefox and handing over a general purpose egg, you won't be very happy with that. The same is for interfaces for this world. It's good for prototyping, for sports, very big issue. Any um, any other questions? Yes. Um, so I found the last part, this Max Plus algebra, really interesting. But I could not quite understand how you proved that um, this switching of the two gates was stable. Um, that part I saw, yes. yes. And also I want to know what the other, uh, some of the other applications of this So the, the, this proof that I say about stability is uh, it's a discrete event uh, stability, that's it. If you have a, a gate that enforces that you always have a certain number of legs on the ground, <coughs> you have another gate that enforces another minimum number of legs on the ground, when you switch, uh, you will get this number of legs respected. So you will never go through trot to gallop in a situation where all the legs go through the air and then come down. And so that's what I mean by stability. It's not stability in the sense of the control, the engine controls that you talk about. Uh, that was the first part. And then the second question is? What are some of the other applications? Yes. The, so the big application for this Max Plus uh, linear systems is uh, uh, synchronization of anything you think about. And one thing is, is uh, the railroad. So trains go to train stations, they need to wait for other trains to arrive, for people to switch trains, and then they take off. Uh, so there's this synchronization. Uh, and the train will leave uh, as soon as the, its timetable says you should leave, or as soon as the late train arrives. So the, the algebra is exactly the same. In fact, the way I learned about this is through seeing a, a talk of a guy about the railroad. And when I saw it, I was like, OK, we're doing this in, in robotics. But it's applied also to factories, uh, where you have to process several parts in assembly and you have to wait for parts to arrive, etc. There's lots of applications. I have a comment and a question. A comment on his point that uh, I want to say what Adam said before about an hour ago that we should not be afraid to you know implement because everything is changing over time and everything is you know improving so html5 will certainly most certainly will improve because all the business and everything is coming towards uh, internet and we all have smartphones so it's it's it is very certainly going to improve and i have a very small question uh, you mentioned in, a, in your second or third slide it was a sense of touch i mean i could not get it what do you think that well, uh, I mean, for me, touch is fundamental. Uh, that's, again, what distinguishes us from a cell phone, is that we touch things. The feedback? Yeah, the feedback that you get from touch. I have things. a uh, suggestion for that. Uh, uh, I use, I was once using a friend's phone, and uh, since you cannot uh, actually touch, uh, you cannot actually get the feedback, so it's pretty hard to type in. You know, so you cannot know if the button buttons push or press or not. So I want to suggest that, you know, why not um, implement a vibration mode that when you push, it vibrates. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's you, you, uh, you 
just get the feedback. Yeah. So that's one thing you can yeah, but that's the only feedback you can get now is the, the vibration when you play those computer games and yeah. it vibrates. No. If, 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 your, if your robot is about to fall down the precipice or something, maybe the, the thing will vibrate and will warn you, hey, pay attention. No, I'm not talking about that. I mean, I'm pushing a button. Yeah. But it does mean I'm not, I don't know if I'm pushing, if, I, if on my laptop I'm pushing, I know. Yeah, I'm yeah. looking at you, I'm pushing a button, I know the button. I mean, yes. But on, on a touch screen, I cannot actually uh, know if, unless and until I look at it and the, and the button gets a little darker and like, you know, to get the feedback. Yeah. So, you know, I was thinking about the, uh, this gadget and the phone vibrates for like uh, two, three, uh, and three seconds or so. So you actually get the feedback. You actually get the feel of pushing a button. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. Yeah. I think that's probably, probably the words falling away. I think that's probably possible. Oh, yeah. oh, I, say, I think the, there's not as big a gap between the control and the computer science as you say there, because things like I didn't spend much time talking about the QCM quality model, but it's not that different from the Max Plus algebra. So they do use similar kinds of concepts, and there are hybrid controllers where you're using, say, some machine learning to learn, uh, like we learn switching controller where the, the, the switching decision is, is, is machine learning, the bottom layer is the uh, uh, normal control system. Yeah. So they're not, they're not, <coughs> not, not, but they're not that far apart. It's true. I mean, they are connected. Definitely, it's not a, it's not an isolated bubble. It's overlapping. But uh, my my message was just, uh, it doesn't look like it's too balanced right now. That's my only message. There's definitely a lot of computer scientists who who try to make their robots do something and they can't figure out why, and it's because they've made some fairly elemental mistake in the control theory side of things, where they're expecting too high bandwidth or they're expecting. I mean, there's an important thing is the physicality. Uh, when you when you live on the computer science world, you have these general abstract algorithms that whatever signal you fed, uh, you have your features, your matching features, and you get uh, your function approximator, and everything works. It's independent of the physicality of your system. But with robots, you have physical things. You have volts, and you have kilograms, and inertias, and things like that. And those things are better captured, perhaps, in the systems of control. Although I would actually, so are there any other questions? So I would actually just a quick poll, because actually I'm, I have a bit of a problem with one of the things you said. Put your hand up if, you're an, if you are not a computer scientist. So it looks like it's not just the computer scientists that aren't using their hands on the basis. I'm a control person. I'll turn balls. So both. <laughs> okay. So. Okay, I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you so much for that.